Uh, back in 2015, uh, we, we, our family relocated back to the area here in Virginia, um, and we went to a church down in Charleston, South Carolina, and um, we knew that the pastor there would always tell us if we're ever traveling um, that the church association was association-related churches. So uh, initially, when we uh, we moved here to Leesburg, we went online to association-related churches, and Destiny was one of few in the area. Um, that you know we we wanted to visit and um, we, we came here a few times before we decided uh, to become members of the church and become active and, and serve in the church and, and you know it's been a very wonderful experience for us here um, here at Destiny and, and um, seeing Destiny's influence in the community and wanting to be a part of that effort. Right. I mean, I, I will say, even though Michael said we, we came here a few times before we decided to really get involved and become members, I, I would say the first time we came, it was an immediate connection for us. We left feeling like we didn't even want to go visit any other churches. Initially, uh, walking through the doors was, was a great experience because you were greeted right away. And a lot of churches, you can walk through the, you know, through the doors of the church, walk into the sanctuary, and then you know you, nobody really says much. Maybe a glad hand here and there, but Destiny was very welcoming. I had multiple people come up to me and, and Amanda and the kids, and uh, just welcome us here, tell us where Destiny Kids was located, and you know showed us where the coffee was. So it was very, very welcoming to, and it, it just shows that representation that that Christ, that God is moving in this church. I, it was just a, a level of energy from the moment that we walked through the door. I mean, in addition to just people um, greeting us and helping us find our way here after church ended, we had several people come up and ask us our names, ask us you know our, about our interests, what we do, uh, and it just it, it made it feel much more like a community that we were supposed to be a part of because people were already showing interest in, in us and our lives and our kids' lives um, just on that first meeting. I think right away um, once once we decided to become members we um, went through the growth track which was awesome experience and just kind of learning um, at the time what destiny was about its mission and you know all the things it has to offer and you know I think taking that survey of kind of helping you understand what are your strengths and weaknesses in terms of where you fit in terms of a mission field um, like I immediately you know because I'm you know I'm, I'm a football guy a coach and Ushering was great for me because, you know, I could help people out to the seats, I could greet people, I could still move throughout the church and then do a lot of things um, that's forward facing and in service to not only the uh, fellow me members of that are part of the body, but to anybody coming through the door that, that's looking for, um, you know, looking for Jesus, that's looking for that connection, um, to be a face and a name um, that, that they can come and talk to and then we can make sure that they, you know, get any services or prayer that they need. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it was a wonderful opportunity. There's a lot of great men that, that have built relationships through the, the ushering team and through other life groups as well. I think that's been a, um, a great aspect of this church is the life groups to be able to grow in fellowship um, and in Christ together. Right, and, and for me, I've always loved working with the kids, so being a part of the dream team has just been amazing. Um, I'm a kid at heart, so I get to roll around on the floor with them and pre-COVID do face painting and all that other <laughs> kind of stuff <laughs> that they would let me get away with back there. Uh, but you know, still the, the worship, the fellowship, watching the kids grow, um, being a part of their lives um, and helping them you know, see what they can do, even at that young, tender age, what they can do to make that connection with Christ. So I've just really thoroughly enjoyed working with the Dream Team and you know, looking forward to continue to work with the Dream Team and just get connected. And there's such a great group of people back there that volunteer that it is like our own, uh, just an additional, another little sect of our family um, that we make connections with. And because of that as well, it's definitely helped us make connections with people then outside of these walls. You know, we get together, we, you know, go to each other's homes, we go out and do events together, looking forward to doing that again post COVID. <laughs> uh, and so it just, it really does add to um, just, the, you know, feeling like we really are one body of Christ because of those sorts of things the small groups, looking forward to kickball again soon. Uh. Yeah. yeah, and I think too, on another note, uh, it, it, you know, the, the impact it's had on our kids. I think mm -hmm. like our kids see us in service of uh, 
you know, fellow members of the body and just in service of the community that, that's coming to our doors. Mm -hmm. And they're actually back serving with Amanda, helping the kids out when they're not in kids church. And, you know, they used to, you know, Ellen and Isaiah would come and want to help set up the auditorium and, and uh, get the offering bucket. So it's a positive influence with them, um, as well as having them together serving with, um, I know um, Saturday Serve has been one that we've served with the Walkers. Mm -hmm. That's been great. And they get the sense of service through what mom and dad, uh, through that example, and that we have to we have to walk and and, and talk, um, and and in terms of being servants of God. And now that we've merged churches, that I'm excited for uh, not only a um, sort of a not a, a sort of a renewed vision. Um, I think pa Pastor Greg has done a wonderful job of providing leadership in this church and showing us the vision in the future, especially with um, everything over at the Desi School of the Arts and the campus that. Um, that he's trying to trying to build up the, you know, there at the Green Lake Farms, but I think you know with Pastor Jeffrey bringing in a a, a new new energy, um, and I tell you he's my type of preacher because I you know growing up in in the Baptist church and you know his his style is really really, really connect with him and I think that vision is going to be awesome for the church and I think in bringing us together. Um, it's, it's, I'm really looking forward to any and everything that he has to offer as well as, um, you know, you know, where we're going together as a church in terms of service to the community, uh, service to each other, um, and, and making sure that the, the kingdom of heaven, um, is alive and thriving here in Leesburg and Loudoun County, all of Northern Virginia. So we can reverberate that, um, you know, throughout, throughout our region. And for me, it's I've, I've felt that instant connection too. Again, you know, just working with the Dream Team and working with the kids. Rachel's been such a great leader back there um, with the Dream Team, and now Priya's on board. And I love her energy and, and what she's bringing uh, to to the kids' church, and you know, seeing the growth there too with those two connections. I'm just for me, I, I really am like just really excited about. <laughs> I'm not going to cry. You're not going to make me cry. <laughs> I'm just so excited about um, the thought of our family being extended yeah, yeah. <laughs> because of um, the connections that we've made here and already knowing the great group of people at Destiny and how they've reached out to our family and supported us in so many ways. Um, and supported our kids like you know people come and you know see Lee Ray in his play and Pastor Greg took Lee Ray out to lunch and you know they come to the football games and all of those sorts of things and the the thought that now we have more people in our family just makes me so excited <laughs> no it is it, it's it's I think you know it's, it's it's an awesome feeling because you know destiny before the changes was a, a great place to be it was a beacon for the community and it still is and I I you know and it's and in my heart, I know that this is only the next step for our destiny, for what is predetermined, what God wants us to do. And I'm, I'm ready, I'm strapped in, I'm ready for the ride because it's just, it's just great people that have been added to an already group of wonderful servants of God. I'm Michael. I'm Amanda. And we're the Comptons. And, and this, this is, is our, our destiny. destiny. Man, you guys are making me cry over there. What an amazing, amazing couple. Thank you to the Comptons. And I, I said this last week, I've just been enjoying each and every one of these stories um, that we are hearing is a part of this series that we're doing called Our Destiny as we're merging um, two churches that had extremely similar DNA into one to become everything God wants us to be in order to do everything God wants us to do in Leesburg and in Loudoun County. Amen, everybody. Amen. So thank you to the Comptons for sharing your story. And before I dive into our sermon today, I've been doing this throughout this series, but I want to kind of keep this in front of you because I know we have people that filter in and out but if you have been connected to either City Hills or Destiny um, pre-COVID, um, obviously as we're beginning to bring these churches together, there's a few things that uh, you could say a few. <laughs> there's a lot of things that have gone into this, and we're still walking through a lot of uh, the, the technical things that it takes to merge two 
entities and organizations. But one thing that you can do right now that has been changed is if you follow um, either church on Instagram, um, you can uh, make sure you're following the right account these days. And that account is Our Destiny DC. So if you're on Instagram, if you're not, you need to get on it just to follow us. If that's the only follow you have, uh, and follow us at Our Destiny DC, interact with us and engage with us there. And we have been working on this, I kid you not, for a month. And this week, we had a breakthrough in the spirit. Come on, somebody. Um, we have been able to merge our Facebook accounts. So if you liked either one of them, you don't have to do anything. Um, because we were able to get both of those accounts into one. And so everybody should be connected. You don't have to do anything there. And I want to thank um, the people that worked so diligently. Uh, Yessie Lassiter, John Showalter, Michelle in the office. Those guys put in a lot of work uh, because Facebook isn't the easiest to communicate with, y'all. I can tell you that right now. And um, they've worked hard on a lot of this stuff. And I'm just so thankful for the amazing people. And you hear this in the stories that are told before my sermon every week. The, the people keep saying this. The amazing people from both sides of these churches that comprise our church. And um, I can tell you right now, I just want to give a huge shout out to the Dream Team. Um, whether you serve in social media, whether you're serving in production back there in the booth, there's people that's back here behind stage that is working switchers for the online presence that you don't even see. There's a lot of people that do a lot of things week in and week out to make sure that we can have church, not just here, but we can get church out there online for people that aren't able to get back into the building just yet. And can we give our dream team a hand, our staff a hand? They've worked so hard. So thank you so, so much. Also, our website domain has changed. If you want to find us on the web, it's ourdestiny.church. That'll get you there. We still have a lot of work to do there on the website, but that is the first step, and you're going to be seeing some changes there over the course of the next uh, month or two as we roll that out. Um, and how many of you know we're going into summer? I, I thought some teachers would be a little bit more excited than that. <laughs> Um, we're going into summer. School's letting out this week, and I know that there's pent-up demand for people getting out and about, so please make sure if you're out of town, you can always catch us live online, or if you can't do it live, make sure to go back and catch us. It's all archived on our YouTube page and channel. It's archived on our website, um, and then also... For our small groups this summer, we know that there's a lot of coming and going right now. And what we have decided to do, especially since we've combined churches and we're moving into this new reality, instead of hosting about a six-week semester of small groups and have uh, kind of like 10 different groups that you can be a part of, which is what we typically do, because of you know coming out of COVID and bringing together two churches, and we want to provide opportunities for our churches to meet and gather together in a safe environment, we have instead decided that we're going to take some strategic moments this summer to have a church-wide get-together. And so we're going to be communicating these things, but you can go ahead and put the first one on your calendar right now is Family Movie Night is July 25th. That's coming up in just a couple of weeks. That's a Friday night. It's going to be at 6.30, and it's going to be on our Greenway property. Um, that's not very far from here. We're going to have an outdoor uh, screen set up. I believe we're going to be showing Ratatouille. Is that the movie? Did I get that right? Ratatouille is going to be showing that night. So it's going to be a family-friendly event. Bring your kids. Uh, bring yourselves. Bring your, fran your friends, your neighbors. Let them know about it. Just bring some lawn chairs. We're going to have it set up in the lawn. We're going to have a great time. It'll be an opportunity to get the families together. And then also for you to meet some new people. And we're going to be doing some strategic stuff like this throughout the summer, getting ourselves together. And then we're going to launch a fresh Great new semester of small groups this coming fall as we're coming out of the summer into the fall. So be listening for more information on that as we get through the summer. And everybody say amen. amen. Now, why I am on week five of a six-week series that we've been calling Our Destiny. 
And I, I believe that God has been speaking to our church as we're framing up um, some foundational uh, uh, values and some foundational um, heartbeat of, of a, our church as we move forward into God's future for us. And we've been looking at this um, through the lens of Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus, the book of Ephesians. And I want to read kind of our foundational text that has carried us through this series. It's found in Ephesians chapter 1. It says, God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. And this is the plan that at the right time he will bring everything. Say everything with me. He will bring everything together under the authority of Christ, everything in heaven and on earth. Through our union with Christ, we too have been claimed by God as his own inheritance. Before we were even born, he gave us our destiny. That's kind of where we pulled this whole idea for this series. He gave us our destiny that we would fulfill the plan of God who always accomplishes every purpose and plan in his heart. We've been talking about this reality the last four weeks, that God has a plan, he has a purpose, that is to bring everything under the authority of Jesus in heaven and on earth. We've talked quite a bit about that. And then last week I reminded us that he's doing that through a body and a group of people. That it's not your destiny, it's our destiny. That when we connect ourselves to the church and to the body of Christ, all of a sudden we begin to be a part of something greater than ourselves. And if we connect ourselves to that body, Paul assures us in Ephesians that we will see God's hand move and that we will be part of something that is successful. Because he said God always succeeds. He always accomplishes his plan and his purpose. You want your life to matter? I want my life to matter. It, if we want to be assured that our lives are going to make a difference and matter, it's when we connect ourselves to the church, to God's body, and we become a part of something bigger than ourselves. And God is going to accomplish his purpose through us. That is our destiny. Somebody say, Our destiny. And then I want to move on today and look at Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read actually a verse of scripture that I read last week, but I want to read it again. And I want to highlight something for us here this week, and then I'm going to come back next week and wrap not only this thought, but the whole series up. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, uh, Paul goes on and he's talking. He says, So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. So Paul is. He's addressing a group of people that is called the Gentiles. And if you're unfamiliar with New Testament and New Testament language, this this group called the Gentiles basically was anyone that was not a descendant of Abraham, anyone that was not a part of the Hebrew people. They were referred to as Gentiles. The Hebrew people saw themselves as um, connected and children of Abraham, who's talked about in the Old Testament. And as children of Abraham, they saw themselves as as inheritors of the promise of God, that God was going to bless their people and their nation and that all the world would be blessed through them. But Paul is communicating that since Jesus came, that Jesus opened the door of this promise to all people and all individuals, not just one particular group of people or one particular nationality, but through Jesus now everyone has access to the promises of God and the family of God. So this is the issue that Paul is dealing with here. He's saying to the Gentiles, you're no longer strangers and foreigners. This destiny that we all have is not just for the Hebrew people, it is for all people. He goes on to say, you are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members, watch how he talks about the church, you're members of God's family. Together, notice the language he's using here, piggybacking off of last week, God's family, and together we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling 
where God lives by His Spirit. I love the language that Paul uses when he talks about the church. He calls it God's family. He uses this communal language and and refers to the church and refers to God's body as a family and His house. It's where His Spirit dwells. And each one of us as individuals are carefully joined together to make up a body, to make up a family that is destined by God to do great things and be used by God to accomplish His mission in the world. It's His mission, our destiny. And when we come into this family, we become a part of God's plan and His purpose. And like any family, a family has values. Like any family, a family has some things that is important to it that kind of keeps it in alignment in order to accomplish a common goal. Every family, whether they are verbalized and put on a piece of paper and rehearsed intentionally or not, every family, for the most part, has a set of values that make up that family, that keep that family aligned and tell what that family is about. Like, you know what it is. If you're a Goodman, this is who a Goodman is, right? If you're a Compton, this is what it means to be a Compton. These are things that the Compton family, the Goodman family, the Smith family, the Jones family, these are things that keep us aligned. These are things that we care about um, in this house. My mom, she was here the last two Sundays. She left yesterday, headed back home. She's not here with us today, so I can talk about her now. But um, you probably had this reality growing up in your house and in your family. You've probably heard your parents say, in my house. Come on, if you had some of them old school parents. You know, I remember growing up and You know, I'd be trying to coerce my mom, convince her into letting me do something or go somewhere. And if it was something she didn't feel quite easy about or didn't want me involved in, she'd be like, no, Jeffrey, I don't want you doing that. You can't go there. Um, Sorry about it. And I'd be like, but mom, she, you know, but mom, what? You know, all the phrases that you vowed as a child that you would never say to your kid that now that you have kids, you find yourself saying, you know what I'm talking about? I hear myself when I'm talking to Elon these days, and when, I, when it comes out, I'm like, that was Sonia Gale, if I ever heard it. How in the world did I become Sonia? But, you know, you, you've heard it said, we all heard it said, and we probably said it to our kids if we, if we have kids. We're like, you know, as long as you're under my roof, eating food from my table, sleeping under covers that I pay for, come on, somebody. Come on, how many old school parents we got in this place? This is the way it's going to be, right? We all kind of probably in some way or another heard that communicated to us as we, as we grew up. In this family, you know, or my mom, she would love to, she'd say this. I don't care if everybody else goes and jumps off a bridge. Are you going to go jump off of it too? You know what I'm talking about? Like, but, but these were sayings. But more importantly, there were certain values that informed decisions that were made in our house of why we did certain things. And they were values that aligned us. Why? Because if you're part of a family, especially if you're a parent, you know this feeling, it's not enough for me to be successful myself. When I become a parent, when I'm a part of a family, it's not just about my individual success. It's about making sure that every member of my family hits the target and gets to where we're going. If I don't get my kids there, if I don't get my spouse there, then I've lost. If it's not all of us getting there at the same place and crossing the finish line at the same goal line, then somehow it's the the win, if we win, is not doesn't quite feel as right. You know what I'm talking about? And so we have these goals, we have these 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 values that 
that shape us, that as we're teaching and instructing our children that, hey, this is what it means to, to operate in this culture. And this is what it means to be a part of this family. This is how we do things. I know other people do it this way, and that's fine. We're not, we're not against them. But, but the vision that we have for our family and the type of people and citizens and neighbors and, that we want to be, this is who we are. And so that's what I want to talk about today and, to, and, and next week. I'm gonna, I want to talk to us as we're, again, moving into this, this uh, newness, coming out of COVID and, and reframing up some things for our church. Like, what are our values? If we're going to be a family, which I am so thankful that we are, if we're a family, what does it mean to be destiny family? Who are we as destiny? Who are we as the church here and now in Loudoun County in the 21st century? What are the values that inform who we are? Now, we could, we could list a hundred of them. Uh, we could pull a hundred from the Bible and they would all be good. But I don't think you want to hear me talking about a hundred different values here today. Some of us want to go eat, including me. Okay? And we're not going to give you a long laundry list because then it becomes confusing. But I want to give you ten values. I'm going to give you five here today and then I'm going to give you five tomorrow. Ten aligning values for our church, for our family as destiny that communicates who we are. So it's, it's going to be a little bit different because uh, I'm going to kind of just scatter. I, I could take, you know, each one of these values and create a three to four week series alone for each one, right? So I'm just going to kind of briefly hit the surface of these as we go through them today and next week. And uh, probably at some point in the future, I'll come back and at least do a series on all 10, and we'll just take a Sunday for each. But I want to I communicate to us as we're moving into this, who, who are we? Who are we as God's family? What, what's important to us? What do we need to agree on? And, and how are we going to be as people of God in our community? First value that we have as destiny is that we are a house. We are a family of faith. Can I get an amen, somebody? Now, I'm not just pulling these values out of thin air because, oh, these are good to have. I'm going to pull these, all 10 of these, Paul talks about in the book of Ephesians. So we're pulling them, and then, of course, they're riddled and sprinkled all throughout your Bible. But I want to look at this. In Ephesians 3, Paul tells them, he says, Because of Christ and our faith in Him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's Presence. I want you to notice how he talks about faith. He talks about having faith in Christ. And then he says, because of that, we can be bold and confident. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians to his letter to the church in Corinth. And he says, since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very Bold. So when I say we are a house of faith, I'm not talking about just any kind of faith. I'm not talking about a passive faith. We are a house of bold faith. We are a house that is going to be guided by a confident, bold faith and not fear. That we will let God be God. That we will expect God to be God. Come on, somebody. This house is a house of faith. This church and this family, if there's one thing that we're going to be, is we're going to have bold faith. We're going to step out in our own personal relationship with God, but then as a church, we are going to live our lives together collectively, believing that God can, and not only God can, but God will move in our lives and in our world in supernatural ways, ways that cannot be understood or explained away by the natural processes of humanity, but things will happen in us, for us, and through us that can only be explained by the hand of God. I'm talking about bold faith. One belief that believes God for the impossible. One that refuses to let God be small. 
One that says we will be, I love the song we've been singing here lately, it, said, it talks about us being a house of miracles. I don't know about you, but I want to be a part of a family and I want to be a part of a church that has miracles moving among it. That we will be a family and we will be a house of miracles. We will be a family that believes what Jesus said, that with God all Things are possible to them that believe. Come on, listen. We can make a choice in our family. We can make a choice to be a church where faith is just a relic. We can make a choice where faith is just something that I put on my agenda and my, my, my social calendar to come and check it off. And you know, hey, I did my religious duty. I paid my penance. And now I'm going to go about my life. Or we can choose to be a church that says, no, 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 no. God is not dead. He's alive. That the God that moved in the scripture is the same God. It says that he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if God moved then he can move now if God moved for Shadrach Meshach and Abednego in Babylon he can move for us in the 21st century if God moved then he can move now I'm not interested in being a part of a family that don't believe God can be God now I'm not interested in being part of a family that doesn't believe that God has the power and the ability to change a life in a moment in His presence. Come on, I want to be a kind of church that on a weekly basis, people walk through those doors who are bound and burdened and confused and disheartened, and they walk into a place that is prepared and a group of people that believes that God can take their life and He can change it and He can turn it around Come on, I believe that God can do the impossible. Somebody say bold faith. Come on, I, a faith that says I may not see how. A faith that doesn't listen to the odds keepers. Come on, somebody. A faith that doesn't like take out our spreadsheet and add it all up and say, well, you know, it doesn't even make sense on paper, so I don't see how this can happen. But a faith that looks impossibility in the eye and says, it may be impossible with man, but with God. God, all things are possible. And we refuse to listen to the odds keepers. Because our God, He don't play the odds. And our God is a God that Paul writes in Ephesians 3 and says that He is able through His mighty power. Somebody say mighty power. That he is able through his mighty power at work, where? Within us. It's not arbitrary. It's not disconnected from us. But we're going to be a church that says, no, God's not just acting on his own, but I'm going to connect myself to the body. And so even though God can and does act out there without me, I'm going to connect myself to the body and the family so that God also works within me. He says, according, because God through his mighty power at work within us is able to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or even think. What Paul is saying is that God is so big and God is so mighty that you haven't thought a thought too big. You haven't prayed a prayer too big for your God to answer. I want to be a church that says I refuse to make God small. So if God doesn't do it, it's not going to be because I didn't pray it. If God doesn't do it, it's not going to be because I didn't believe that he had the power and the ability. I want to be a family that says, hey, I'm going to pray big prayers. I'm not going to pray small prayers. I'm not going to pray puny prayers. But I'm going to pray with bold faith and confidence. I got a word I like to use. It's made up, but I'm from Louisiana. I make up words. It's not confidence. It's called Godfidence. 
Because it's not faith in my own ability. It's not confidence in my ability. It's not confidence in my intelligence and in my ingenuity and in my talent. That's not what it is. But I also believe that I serve a God and I'm connected to a family that He works through that has the power to do what I cannot do. So I will walk with my head held high. I will pray prayers that are big and impossible because I've got a confidence. I've got a God that can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that I could ask or think. That's who we serve. Come on, that's who we declare. That's who we worship. I told you I could just preach all day right there, but i got to move on. Okay, big faith. Somebody say big and bold faith. Bold faith. The second thing that, that, that the value that we're going to have is prayer. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Ephesians 6, Paul says, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. He writes in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, it says, never stop praying. I want us to be a church of persistent prayer. Somebody say persistent prayer. That we believe in the power of prayer. That prayer is our priority. There's a lot of people when faced with circumstances or situations in their life that they use prayer as their last resort. Come on, you know some people like that? Like they try to fix it every other way with every other connection. And when all else fails, then they pray. Okay, now I'm going to ask you to tell on yourself. Anybody ever been guilty of that yourself? You don't have to raise your hand. I won't, I won't embarrass you, like, but you know, I've kind of slipped my mind because I've been guilty of that. But a, a, as a family, as a destiny family, I want us to make prayer our priority. Before we try anything else, we stop and we pray. Paul says you got to pray without ceasing. What does that mean? Does that mean we have to 24 hours a day, seven days a week, kind of be on our knees and prostrate? When I was a kid and I would hear that verse, I was like, how in the world do you do that? How do you pray without saying? Paul's not talking about a physical act of prayer where you kneel and you're, you're physically. I mean, there's, that's an aspect of prayer. But more importantly, what Paul is talking about is a posture of prayer. In other words, that you live your life postured in prayer. That when you're walking down the sidewalk, walking your dog in the morning, that you're mind that your heart is just open to the presence of God. You don't have to be in some sort of tabernacle or temple or church building in a prayer service to pray, but that I'm constantly communicating with my creator, that when I walk on the job that I'm sensitive to the presence and the power of God and what he's wanting for me in that moment, that I am continually communicating and talking to God because prayer is our power source. That prayer is the engine that fuels the supernatural within the body of Christ. That when I get into impossible situations like we just sang about a while ago, that I understand my help comes from God and God alone. That my help doesn't come from my 401k. That my help doesn't come from my financial advisor. That my help doesn't come from my counselor. And all those things are great and they're good and they're gifts from God to us. I'm not discouraging any of those things. But at the end of the day, before everything else is said and done, I understand that my source is God. God and God alone. Like David said, when my heart is overwhelmed, I, don't lead me to the doctor first. Don't lead me to the counselor first. When my heart is overwhelmed, don't lead me to the nutritionist at first. When my heart is overwhelmed, he said, lead me to the rock that is higher than I am. Take me to Jesus. Let me connect to the source of my strength and my power that prayer will be my priority. I want us to be a praying church. Why? Because a praying church is a powerful church. A praying church is a church that sees and invites the hand and the power and the miracles of God in it and among it. A praying church is a church that lets God be God. My house, Jesus said, shall be called a house of of prayer. I think prayer should be a value. I think prayer should be important to us. I think prayer should be something that we give 
ourselves to. I love Jesus looks at the disciples one day. He says, when you pray, pray like that. It, G- Jesus assumed that the natural posture of his body would be prayer. Not if you pray. Not if you have time and get it in your... He says, when you pray. And I think for too many people in their own individual lives, and God forbid if churches ever get this way, that we kind of look at prayer as like, like, a, like, a, like, a, like an add-on package, right? It's an optional package. Kind of like when you go to, the, go to the car lot and you're shopping for a car, you know, they got all kinds of cars there, and you got the base package, and then you got, you know, well, then you can move up to this package and you can get leather seats and you can get, you know, whatever they put in cars now, like <laughs> Bluetooth and auto drive, whatever it is, like you get whatever package you want. And, and so too, too many people treat prayer like an add-on. Let me tell you something, baby. Prayer ain't a package. Prayer is the engine under the hood. And I don't care how pretty and dolled up and fancy the car is. You can have the nicest leather. You can have the greatest equipment. You can have all the bells and whistles you want. But before you buy it, you better pop the hood and see if the thing's got an engine in it. Because if it don't have an engine, it ain't going anywhere. What is prayer? Prayer is the engine. It's the power that fuels the church. You want to be powerful? Pray. Somebody say persistent prayer. We're going to be a praying church. We're going to be a praying family. Third value that we need to be and have is we want to be generous. Somebody say generosity. Watch what Paul talks about here in Ephesians. He says God has given each one of us a special gift through the generosity of Christ. So generosity is not just some vague value that we just say you need to have. He says, no, we're taking a cue because our head, our Lord of the church was generous. God is generous. And because he's generous, we're going to be generous. Watch what he goes on to say in Ephesians 4. Give generously to others in need. Ephesians 5, you can be sure that no greedy person will inherit the kingdom of Christ and of God, for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping things of this world. 2 Corinthians 8, since you excel in so many ways in your faith, your gifted speakers, your knowledge, your enthusiasm, and your love for us, I want you to excel also in this gracious act of giving. Paul says, excel in faith. Excel in all of the other things that we talk about. But you better also excel in generosity. Why? Because our God is supremely generous. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. And he didn't give junk. He didn't give something that he had tucked away in the attic or the basement that he hadn't used in a few years. No, he said he gave his one and only son. He gave the most valuable thing he had to give so that you and I could be restored to relationship with him. And Paul says because he is generous, then we need to take on that spirit of generosity. Somebody say generosity. Generosity. We want to be a church that is intentionally generous generous we want it to excel in generosity we want to excel in living beyond ourselves because that's actually what generosity is generosity is just coming to the understanding that I live for something beyond myself that I'm generous that I have a spirit of generosity I want us as individuals to have a spirit of generosity on us and then I want this church this family to have a spirit of generosity. And when you talk about generosity, people automatically go to one topic, and that is money. And that certainly is a part of it. Because money is what we earn in exchange for our time and our talent and much of our life. And there's plenty of scripture in the Bible that talks about how we order and how we how how we set and how we handle our financial resources. And that's certainly a part of it. I want us to be a generous church. And I thank God that we have been a generous church. And I want us to continue to grow in generosity. Like Paul talks about, I want us to excel, in, not just to get to a certain position of generosity and then say, okay, well, we did it. But I want us to grow even more and to excel in generosity. I want to just brag on this church. I want to brag on the two that are now one, okay? 
that we just came through a year of COVID where there was a lot of uncertainty. We had to shut church down quite literally. We didn't have an in-person gathering for something like nine to ten months. Nobody even came into the building. And there was a lot of uncertainty. And there was a lot of uncertainty in the lives and the families of people that made up this church family. And people walked through hardships and people walked through difficulties and both churches tried to do our best to minister in, in the ways that we could in the reality that we were in. But I want to just brag on you. I want to thank each and every one of you that's watching online and that is here that continue to give into the church and continue to be generous with your resources. Now we, I'll be honest with you, both of us, we took a hit in our budget this year. We had things happen. Events happen. Life happens. And those things happen. But can I tell you, the heart of the leadership of this church is to be generous. And so in a year where there was a lot of uncertainty, and in a year where a lot of you stepped up and gave, even though it hurt you to give, you still gave. I want to commend you for that, and I want to thank you for that. Because in a down year, we still, between the two churches, were able to minister to needs in our community through a very difficult year. And I don't know, we gave in excess of over $50,000 to help people pay mortgages and pay rent through this time of COVID when people were losing their jobs. Jobs. We fed people. We donated food. We donated gift cards. We were able to come alongside and donate school supplies as kids went back to school this year and, and families were dealing with uncertainty and not knowing how to provide school supplies for, for their children. I want to thank you because even when we were in the middle of an uncertain year, we stepped up and we gave. Why? Because we refuse to be greedy and we refuse to live like we live for ourselves. We don't live for ourselves. We live for people beyond us and we will be generous because our God is generous and we will give and we will go and we will serve and we will do whatever we need to do. We're still combining everything. I'm still trying to get my head around all the numbers, but I know for a fact that over $50,000 went to mortgage and rent relief alone between our two churches. You did that. We did that. And we were able to help people within our church, but the vast majority of that went outside this church into this county. And I'm so thankful for that. And I'm so proud of that, that we don't live just for ourselves, but we live for others around us. Somebody say generosity. We're going to be generous. We're going to have a spirit of generosity. It's not just money. It's generous with your time. Generous with your ability. Generous with, you, you, you know what it's like. Have you ever been around someone that just had a generous spirit about them? That they wanted to do, they, it, it all boils down to, I want to do whatever I can, whatever resource I have. Whether, whether it's money, whether it's wisdom, whether it's experience, whether it's time, whether it's t teaching you a trait, whatever it is, I want to be generous and I want to give to you anything that I can to help you become everything God has created you to be. That's the kind of church I want us to be. That's the kind of person I want to be. I want to be generous. Somebody say generosity. generosity. I want to have a spirit of generosity. Fourth, I want... To have the value of excellence. Somebody say excellence. Ephesians 5, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Watch this. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. That we don't act thoughtlessly, but that we have a spirit of excellence about us. Ephesians 6, work with enthusiasm. Somebody say enthusiasm. Not with your head held low, not griping the whole way, right? He says, work with enthusiasm as though you were working for the Lord rather than people. So don't show up on your job. Oh, come on, somebody. <laughs> work with enthusiasm and understand that, yeah, you got a boss that you may not like that gets on your nerves or you got a coworker that gets on your nerves or, I don't know, truth be told, you may get on their nerves. <laughs> but that's another sermon. Um, but that I don't walk in thinking that I work for X and X company. I may get my check from X and X company, but I'm working for the Lord. That everything that I do and everything that I touch is a reflection of my God.
That everything that I do and everything that I'm involved in shows how much I love and how seriously I take my calling from him. That I work with enthusiasm like I'm working for God, not people. Romans 12, 11, never be lazy, but work hard. Not just a spirit of excellence, but enthusiastic excellence. That I'm going to live my life in a way, I'm going to be, I want to be an extra mile church. Come on, somebody. How many wants to be an extra mile church? Jesus said, if somebody asks you to go one mile, don't just go one mile. Have a spirit of generosity and excellence on you that says, I'll go two miles with you. Why? Because I want to bless you. And I want you to understand, I'm not doing this strictly for you, but I'm working not just for you. I'm working for the Lord and he's generous so I'm going to be generous and he does all things well so I'm going to do all things well I'm not going to just do anything any old way that we're going to have a spirit of excellence on us as a church God gave us his best so we're going to give God our best anybody ever been around somebody that just had a spirit of excellence on them makes all the difference doesn't it I don't really care to be around people that don't care much you know what I'm saying you know what I'm talking about it's the difference in staying at Motel 6 and you know the Ritz not that I've ever stayed at the Ritz but the reason the Ritz can charge what the Ritz charges is because they ain't Motel 6 you ain't walking in the lobby like, you know, here's a lamp that's unplugged and, you know, there's a cobweb over here and they left the light on for you, but that's about it, right? You walk into the Ritz and everything's polished. You won't find dust anywhere. You won't find little pieces of gum, wrapper laying on the floor. When somebody sees you, they'll say, Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Their motto is ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. That's their company motto, right? And that spirit of excellence, you know what it's like. I mean, you know, when, when you're young and you're first married and you try to, you know, get away and go on a vacation, I mean, you're pinching pennies, you know, trying to just do anything, right? And, and I remember taking my, my wife and we're going, we call them adventures, they were adventures, right? You go in these hotel rooms and you don't even want to like pull the cut. You just like, like, there was one hotel room we stayed in one time and I didn't put us in that, mind you. Like somebody else put us up in that. I won't tell you who they are. You wouldn't know them anyway. I won't call them out. But we laid down and I looked and you know how those, those old felt blankets you know, they used to put on those hooks. Yeah. Gives me the heebie-jeebies right now. And we laid down, and I looked down, and it just was coated in hair. And I looked, and I, I literally jumped. I was like, oh, my God. I jumped out of the bed. Like, I'm not laying in that. And you, you, it, it's supposed to be a place where you get away, Right? But you end up more stressed. Why? Because there's no spirit of excellence on it. But when you go into a place that people have not acted thoughtlessly, but they have acted thoughtfully, and that every detail matters. That's why if we're working, for, if we're the family of God, God's family should be the, have the best reputation out of any organization that you could ever have. Why? Because he's king. And we're not working just for people. We're working for the king. And the king's house should be the best house that anybody walks into. And the king's business should be handled better than any other business that's handled. Can I get a witness somebody? Can I get an amen somebody? That we have a spirit of excellence, excellence on us. And the last and final thing, I'm going to give you this and I'm done. Is the value of hospitality. Hospitality. Robust hospitality. Active hospitality. Ephesians 3.19, may you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. In other words, you experience the love even though you don't understand the love fully. 
In other words, God doesn't wait for us to understand him before we experience him. In other words, God is hospitable. He has his arms and says, whosoever will, let him come. That was his qualifications. Whosoever. Not if you fit in this category or that category or this people group or that demographic or you're that race or you're this nationality or you have this particular worldview. He said, whosoever will let him come. What kind of family are we going to be? We're going to be a family that exercises hospitality. We're going to do what Paul said in Romans 12. We don't just pretend to love others. We really love them. And that in Romans 12, he says, be eager to practice hospitality. That we are going to be eager to love people. That we are going to be eager to make room for new people. That it isn't just about us, our four, and no more. But every day we show up, we're going to show up with excellence. Every weekend we're here, we're going to be here with excellence. And we're also going to have the door wide open for whosoever will. And we're not going to check with them at the front door and say, well, do you do think this? And do you believe that? And do you feel this way? And do you align with this? And do you align with that? No, we're saying here, just like our Father saying, whosoever will, come on. And you need to experience the love of God before you even understand Him. And if you experience the love of God, then God can begin to transform your life and all of a sudden you'll see things and think things and believe things that maybe you didn't do believe when you came. But the power and the love of God can transform your life. But can I tell you, the only way they experience it is through His body. So here I'm ended with this. Last scripture. I'm going to close. I'm done. Ephesians 1. Here it is. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Please listen to this very carefully, and I'm letting you go. Watch what he says. Before he made the world, he loved us and chose us. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. He has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. In other words, God decided in advance he was going to love us before we ever got here. He didn't wait until we got here to see what kind of ideologies we were going to buy into and to see what kind of person we were going to be and then decide if he loved us. He predetermined and predecided, I love them, I'm going to a cross for them, and I will shower them with kindness. What kind of church would we be if we predecided? Now, that don't get some of us excited like it gets me excited. But when I read that this last week, I put on my shouting shoes in my house. That I am going to live my life pre determined. I'm not going to wait until a person or an issue is presented before me and hear the story and weigh all the ins and outs and determine can I love them? Come on, somebody. I am pre deciding. That no matter who it is, I will love them. Why? Because that's what my God did for me. Before I ever got here, he already determined, Jeffrey, I'll love him. I'll love him in good times and bad. I'll love him when he aligns with my word and even when he strays from my word. I'll love him. I'll love him. I'll love him. I'll love him. I'm not going to wait and make that determination when he gets here. I'm already going to get here. I'm, I'm going to be waiting on him with love. When he gets to the door, I'm going to be loving him. When he gets to the door, I'm going to shower kindness on it. What kind of family would we be? I don't have to work through issues. I don't have to fight through issues. I'm just going to be hospitable. I'm just going to love you. I want you to accept. We've been talking about it being a family, right? And that we're the body of Christ and that the power of God works through the body, right? I don't have to preach the last four weeks to you right here to get this, right? You've been hanging with me. And we just read in Ephesians 1 
that, that Paul said, I want you to experience the love of God even though you don't fully understand it. So if we are wanting to reach people that are not like us, if we are wanting to reach people that are far from God, Paul said you have to experience the love of God before you understand. If the church isn't the one delivering the kindness and the love of God, how will the people experience it? Now we can say we want them to come to God all we want to, but God's looking back at us and says, well, you're my body, you're my hands, and you're my feet. The only way they're going to experience it is when you get off of your pedestals and you get out of the courtrooms and you get into the homes and you get into the places where people need, oh, somebody, hear what I'm saying right now, that we are going to shower people with the kindness and the love of God. And let God do in their life what only He can do. Can I get an amen, somebody? Come on, stand to your feet all over this house with me. Thank you for hanging with me. Look, 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 look. I know, I know. These are, I'm, I'm taking a little bit of time through this series, okay? But it's important. I'll make it, to you, uh, make it up to you on the back end as we go into our new series. We're going to start a new series in two weeks, and we're calling it... What are we calling it? <laughs> Summer of Psalms. Summer of Psalms. We're going to be going through some Psalms. I'm going, to give you, I'm going to give you some of your time back, okay? But this stuff is important as we go forward as a church. Who are we going to be? What kind of person, what kind of church are we going to be? We're going to be a church of bold faith. We're going to be a church of persistent prayer. We're going to be a church practices intentional generosity come on somebody we're going to be a church that practices kindness and, and hospitality and I'm thinking trying to figure out that fifth one excellence thank you that's who we're going to be come back next week and I'll finish this list out and we're going to celebrate and have a good time as a big family. Amen, everybody. Come on, I'm, I'm flipping the script. I took a little bit more time. You don't have to worry about singing. But I do want us to do this. I want us to close our eyes. I want us to throw our hands up in the air. Lord Jesus, I thank you for letting me be a part of this amazing, incredible body. And I pray, Lord, that we would be the body of Christ, that we would be a family that aligns behind these values, not just any values, but values that you, oh God, values that you owned and that you portrayed in your relationship and in your posture toward us. Let us embrace them and take them to our world. Let us embrace them and employ them in our own lives and let us us be the body let us be who you want us to be and how you want us to be it to our world around us in the mighty name of Jesus Christ and everybody say amen hey everybody have a great week I love you we'll see you next week Sunday 10 a.m.